Good afternoon, ladies, gents, kids, and pets. Firstly, apologies for the little technical lag. I'm going to blame it on Mercury retrograde or whatever planet is in retrograde right now. Uh, welcome to our third edition of the 100 Beautiful Things web series. My name is Nisha Maharaj, and I form part of the marketing team at the VNA Waterfront. Currently, I lead the business to business marketing strategy for the neighborhood. But every now and then, I have the opportunity to jump into a project that really talks to our ethos and philosophy as a waterfront neighborhood. In April this year, our partners at the Platform Creative Agency sat down with us. Uh, and at that point, we were two to three weeks into le level five of lockdown. Um, and we felt it was apt and needed that we create a platform to showcase and celebrate our local talent from artists to designers and really give them the support and uh, and showcase uh, that talks to the ingenuity and resilience uh, that we find in our city and country. There were various themes that we curated the, uh, the exhibition against. Um, and as you know, each webinar unpacks a theme in further detail and looks at how and why it's relevant in the context of creativity and design in where we find ourselves today. So today's episode uh, talks to sustainable design uh, and how sustainability linked with design has the power to create a better future uh, and how a design that is considerate can actually boost a healthy circular economy and have a positive impact on our environment and the, com the communities around us. Before I introduce our speaker panel, just a few tips. Um, I'm someone that talks with my hands, so please bear with me as I air control us through this discussion. Um, there is a functionality that can allow for questions, so if you do have questions, pop them into, into the text box and we'll, we'll get to it uh, within the discussion or at the end. And if you feel compelled to share quotes or tips from our speakers, please do so using the VNA Waterfront handle. That's at V and A Waterfront, V A N D A Waterfront, and hashtag one double zero beautiful things. So without further ado, I'm going to, to get to our speaker introduction. And first up, we have Jasper Eels, co-founder of Sealand Gear and New Dad. Congratulations, Jasper. Uh, Jasper's entrepreneurial spirit comes from his family, who have also built some legacy brands locally, um, and he's just fantastic to to be engaging with uh, the mind behind the Sealand gear apparel and and lifestyle products that, believe it or not, are developed from sustainable repurposed materials like advertising canvases, yacht sales. Um, and it really is such a uh, such a genius uh, concept and idea to to talk about today. So thank you, Jasper. Um, next up on our lineup, we have French expat Alexi Grosko, um, who is the co-founder of Ocean Hub Africa. Um, and Alexi and his team are doing some fantastic work in the area of accelerating startups that are geared. Uh, to fighting the crises that face our oceans. And despite Alexi's uh, bout of seasickness, <laughs> they've managed to do some fantastic work with the launch of the hub in February this year. Our third speaker on the panel has been part of the Waterfront neighborhood for some years now. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome Davis Ndungu, uh, who's a designer within the watershed and you cannot leave the watershed without spotting these vibrant recycled flip-flop sculptures. And Davis has done some fantastic work in cleaning up our beaches in the process of making fantastic items that, that feature in the homes of, of, of locals. So thank you, Davis. Um, and lastly, uh, Tracy Shamali uh, has also joined us. Uh, Tracy is a design and lifestyle writer Previously the managing editor for Condé Nast House and Garden, Tracy moved on to the communications director uh, at the Guild Group, where she sunk her teeth into the world of African design, 
and um, through initiatives like the annual business conference of design, uh, she is really be been able to, to excel in that area. Um, we're very really grateful to have her back on our shores after uh, writing from, from the Mexican borders around design. Uh, and she's joined our curatorial team on the 100 Beautiful Things initiative. So welcome, Tracy. Uh, without yeah. further ado, uh, I'm going to jump into the, uh, the actual meat and content of this powerful topic. Um, so firstly, Tracy, I think it would be good to, to just unpack, you know, the, the link and connection between sustainability and design and why we've highlighted that as a pillar um, of curation against the 100 Beautiful Things initiative. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Nisha. It's really been an honor to be involved in this initiative and to be able to write some of the stories around 100 Beautiful Things and to see, to like, re remember how ingrained sustainability can be within design. I think at the moment our world is changing so much, there's no doubt about that, and people are really looking into how things are produced, how where things come from, who's making the things that they buy, and like people are actually looking at their own consumption methods more and more. So where we used to think that it was cool to get things from overseas and get the latest thing every season mm. off the shelf, it's now the coolest thing is to buy something that's local, something that's generally carefully handcrafted, something where you can actually trace back to the person who made it. Mm. There's a name attached to it very often even. So that's why I think many, most, let's almost all of the hundred beautiful things you could say have an element of sustainability in them because they're all about South African creativity and innovation. And they're part of creating that circular economy in our country. Uh, but there are some things that I can name from the hundred beautiful things that are specifically related to plastic free July, because that's kind of where we're at right now. There's the, and everyone can find these on the 100 Beautiful Things website for more details and the stories behind them. But there's the artwork of Mungeni Butelezi. He paints with molten discarded plastic. And then there are the products by the joinery. They turn disused plastic into felt, which is, then becomes their material to make slippers, laundry baskets, really incredible uh, products and they've managed to keep half a million plastic bottles from landfill already. Um, and then another incredible, I absolutely love it. And as soon as the watershed is open, everyone needs to go if they haven't been to see the color extravaganza chandeliers that are there. Yeah. These are these magnificent showstopper chandeliers made from repurposed detergent bottles and shampoo bottles absolutely colorful and made by our workshop, which is a social design initiative in Langa. So those are some like with plastic, but then I also loved writing about Katekani Moreku, who's a recent fashion graduate in Durban. He does these wraparound garments that are inspired by his Sekulana culture, where clothing is made from fabric offcuts and milli meal packets and mismatched buttons because that's what he finds. So it's not about creating new, it's about using what we already have to just think in a new way. So both Katekani and Jasper's Sealand gear were um, won prizes last year in Twig Sustainable Fashion Awards. Twig um, is T-W-Y-G, and it's an online platform that's promoting a sustainable way of living. And that was another one of our 100 beautiful things. And I think that there is a platform such as that that's really gaining a lot of traction in South Africa, shows that people are thinking more consciously about what they consume and are wanting that kind of information so that they can make better decisions. So you'll see from our three speakers now that there really is this movement towards being more conscious. 
Fantastic. Can Thank you, Tracy. This. And I think that's a, that's a great segue to uh, my next question, which is directed at, uh, at Jasper. Uh, you know, one of the things we love about Sealand gear is the quality, the design, the aesthetic. Um, and I wanted to get your view on, you know, from a business point of view, sustainability as a core value of your brand, you know, um, how has it impact, um, impacted your business? Uh, and what are some of the things that you can share on, on that point? Thank you very much, Nisha. Um, it's a pleasure to be with everybody today and um, very much so to be part of the 100 Beautiful Things project. Um, so sustainability is absolutely a, a key pillar within the Sealand brand. And um, it is something which is really in the DNA of our business. It's something which um, is in the driving seat of why we do the things we do and how we do them. Um, I think it's it's really important in saying this is to explain why we are doing what we're doing because it kind of it answers the question to a degree and the, our company why is put in a way as to we are here to protect protect the natural environment while uplifting our community through innovative design and creativity and we like to look at using business as a vehicle to educate and how to inspire and to have an, a tangible impact on the environment as well as the individuals. And then as um, Tracy spoke about and how we can have an impact on the fashion industry or the design industry and showing how sustainability, which I'll elaborate on what we refer to sustainability shortly can do. Um, but we're very much action driven, we conscious approach to social and environmental responsibility. And most importantly, we look at aspirational and innovative solutions, but use um, an educational voice to, to drive um, and improve on our process. So I think in saying that, it's, it's important for me to just elaborate on when, when we refer to sustainability, what that means, because sustainability as a word is, is used a lot nowadays and i think that sometimes it's misused but in the sealand brand and the sealand language sustainability we refer to it as there's two parts of it one is a social responsibility and the other is an environmental responsibility uh, and when so when we talk about um, our business and how we operate in a sustainable way it's always factoring um, those two two elements in and um, to continue on that and talking around the aspirational, the educational side of our business, this is one of, I think it's one of the key decisions which we've made as a business and the way we're building our momentum and our voice around our business is we absolutely consider the environment and our people and all our decision making. But it's very important that at the same time in building a brand, we've wanted to have the aspirational component of what we do and how we do it. Because our, our decision on doing that really allows us to reach more people and to inspire them in, in what we're doing and showcase the beautiful things in which you can do and create from waste. Um, as Tracy mentioned in Plastic Free July and the various other people in the panel here today. Um, and once we've created that aspirational component, we have much bigger chance of reaching a, a larger audience. And once we've reached that audience with the aspirational brand, that's where we kick in our educational voice. And that is the way that the Sealand brand is managing to, to get our story out to more people. And that story is an informative story, which not only looks cool and has the aspirational component, but it, it really does um, educate as well. And I suppose that also talks to our, our um, affiliation with various... Um, various groups such as the beach co-op um which is uh, is a partnership which uh, sealand has um and it really builds on the educational side um of our business but i think to answer your your question the sustainable part of sealand is 100 percent a vital part however I don't think that it's uh, we're not in a time now in this world where you can just make a sustainable product and expect it to to um, to succeed. It has to tick multi. I mean, we live in a very competitive world. So if I know from our side, first and foremost, the product needs to be functional. It has to be. It has to look beautiful, 
And in doing those two and merging those two together, it really most importantly has to tick the, the sustainable box of materials and people and processes. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the success of our brand is purely based on sustainability. However, it's a vital part of the success of our business. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. And I, I could talk for a long time, but I know that there's lots of people to talk and um, there's various topics to get through. So yeah, thank you. No, that, that's lovely. That's lovely. Thank you for that view, Jasper. And we're really, very lucky to have the Sealand Gear brand as part of our canal district. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and that's, that leads me to, on this point of uh, creativity and, uh, and making sure that we have the balance right between all of these factors, um, I'd like to pick your brain, Davis, on you know, the, this concept of using recycled flip-flops um, to produce such beautiful uh, items and, and, and design work. Uh, it's quite unique. So tell us a little bit more about where this idea came from, what sparked it, uh, and your journey. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I've always been a, an artist, I think as far as I can remember. Uh, but originally I was um, uh, carving woods and um, uh, before I changed the medium to recycled art. And um, um, the problem, the, the thing that made me to change at first because I, I couldn't afford wood and uh, uh, because um, to be able to survive, you need to uh, you need to be, to be, uh, to be able to um, uh, to do something that other people are not doing. So uh, that's that's exactly why why I did it. And only later to realize that uh, not not only the change of the medium um, um, made economic sense, but a better one, an economic one, an environmental one. Fantastic. You you mentioned your your journey started with the exploration of materials and you know the accessibility and resources around wood as an example um and jasper i know you've you've also had your your fun and games when it came to material sourcing uh and just you know being transparent about what goes into the production of these products um and also just some of the 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 challenges that that young designers uh, face within uh, within this arena and and making sure that the product lives up to to scratch while having the right materials. So you know, if there's, uh, I just want to pick your brain on the on the hints and tips when it comes to materials. Sure, sure. Um, I think from from personal point of view, I've always looked further than just the normal material. It, it started before I was involved in Sealand, where I was actually building furniture and. Um, I had all these offcuts of timber and metal and so on. And I started to see uh, characters of sculptures in the waste material. And what I started to do then was create these little sculptures made from all the offcuts. And that, what that, the message in that is really that it made me look at waste through a different lens. And th from that moment on, I, wherever I was going, when I saw rubbish or waste, I wouldn't see it as rubbish or waste with no value. I would see it as whether it's an arm for one of my sculptures or an eye or an old paintbrush being the hair of a, of a little figurine or something like that. And it, it really just changed my whole perception on waste. And what happened and where that led to was me meeting uh, my business partner and the, the co-founder of Sealand, Mike. And Mike was, um, he was making bags out of old yacht sails at a time which had a very nautical um, feel. And we came to hear ideas of how we perceived waste and what we could do with waste and the opportunity for a revitalized brand. And we joined forces at that time, and we, that's when Sealand launched. And that was, um, so we launched it at the, the beginning of 2016. 2015, we spent a lot of time just working on the brand and getting it all ready. But the journey which we've gone through now has been an incredible journey in terms of how one perceives waste and how one sources waste and how one processes waste. And we refer to it as waste because essentially it is waste. And there's so many different forms of waste in which one, which falls into under our waste category. Um, we work with old yacht sails where a sail has sailed around the world and you know, it's then been damaged or replaced. We work with, offcuts or end of roll of new yacht sale where a yacht sale manufacturer will be 
um, building new sales and then um, that, that there will be a leftover couple of meters or off cuts. So we work with that. So we work with used material, off, grade, um, off cuts and B grade material, end of roll material. Um, and so it comes in in various forms. And from our brand, we're, we're looking at how do we look at scaling something which is traditionally seen as very craft, upcycling as a, as a process is, it's very seldom done on a, on a volume-based um, scale. So th those are the challenges which as a business we, we face and how do we very importantly stay authentic and true to the roots of our brand and that is working with waste material. Um, so we've also started to experiment with recycled materials, similarly to what Tracy spoke around the joinery and the girls working with um, old plastic bottles into felt. We've worked with material which combines old plastic bottles and um, uh, upcycled cotton waste and blended into new materials. But I would like to talk about one particular project in general, which is um, through um, it's a program called uh, Green Cape and Wis uh, Wisp. And what they do is they link industries with waste with people who can utilize the waste. So we have a strategic partnership, uh, which we refer to as uh, a waste management solution, which we offer. Where Scan Displays is a local company that does advertising billboards for the convention center and various other events. After that event, that advertising banner is redundant. So what we do then is we, we, we take those banners off their hands and we use that and build it into our product. We do the same with uh, companies like Vans, the shoe company, who also do a lot of uh, advertising and banners. And we work with them and develop bespoke products as well as integrate mm. the materials into our own products. And um, so, yeah, I think that it, it's always, a, I think also just one last thing on that is with, when, when sourcing material in a sustainable way, it, it's, there's no easy solution. So. One needs to forget about thinking that doing building a brand or a business which uses sustainable material is easy. It's not easy and it does cost more. However, it's so rewarding. And as long as you can justify why you're doing it from a sustainable perspective, so in our side, it's environment and people consideration, it's, imp it's important to acknowledge that there could be multiple angles or decisions or routes you could go. But as long as you can decide this is the right one and justify it from your environmental and people's perspective, then it's, then it's the right decision to go with. And that's the kind of the way which we've, we've decided to move as a business. And therefore, we have a, an answer or a reason as to why we're working with B-grade material or used material or so on. Um, but our material is what makes our products and our brand unique. Um, so, that yeah, thanks. That is certainly, certainly, certainly the case. Uh, thanks, Jasper. And, you know, one of the things I'm hearing you say is that it really is about connecting the dots and, um, and not the concept of each man is on his own island, but rather uh, engaging with, with people and, and companies within the industry that can collectively look at, uh, at how we can tackle this uh, the school of materials, uh, which yeah. brings me to my yeah. next point, uh, Lexi. Uh, you know, it's it can be intimidating for a young business owner to um, you know embark on this on this journey. Um, and from the startups that that you guys have been working with, you know, what are some of the things that um, that that can offer as uh, as an advisory to this uh, when it, when we talk repurposed materials, plastic, uh, the whole world of, 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 uh, that you're unpacking with your cohort. Um, just some insight there would be great. So um, you say it's, it, it seems, uh, it appears daunting for some of them. Uh, there's, there's a couple of things uh, I want to sp speak about. Speaking back to what Tracy said earlier, um, you know, sustainable development as a company strategy or a pillar within the company develop the company's development used to be a competitive advantage, and now it's becoming a standard. So, if you do not want to take that into account, uh, you you not being progressive, you being very old school, and it's it's it's, it's a stance, but it's not something that will see your uh, your business prosper in the longer run. Most likely not. There's also a new definition of progress, right? We used to think of progress as economic uh, um, you know value and social development now it's economic value social development within the finite ecosystem um, you know, that we, we thrive in and we live in so these are the environmental impact and sustainable development for new businesses is 
becoming essential to their strategy uh, and and it's no longer a competitive advantage as i was saying so that's from your strategy now if you talk about profitability uh well it, you know profitability is cost minus uh, it's revenue minus cost so you need to look into uh where you where you apply your margin who are your target you can choose to do higher volume um lower margins or higher margins and and lower volumes so uh for uh, higher higher margins lower volume you need to target um you know a particular uh, class of people who can afford uh, nicer design better quality and things like that and you need, so you need to be more wary of the type of waste that you're taking into your repurposing designs and and whatnot and if you want to do uh, obviously the larger volumes and and the lower um, margin you need to look into reducing the costs in the first place so for this you will need to look into uh, waste products uh, that you don't have to process too much in order to make your new products so it's sort of basic stuff uh, that you have to do uh, you know around profit understanding profit and your positioning on the market right and to find funding from there because obviously all the small businesses that come to us uh, and in general always looking to get a bit of funding to get a push um i guess it does it does not really come anymore in the form of grant funding. A lot of people have come to us saying, hey, you know, we're doing this thing which is which got an environmental impact. Do you think we can get some philanthropic money or grant money or some any type of support like this? It's it's no longer really the case. Um, because again, sustainable development is now becoming a standard. Uh, and but you will be able, if you set up a business, as Jasper was saying earlier, uh, you need to look into the profitability of your business into having a product or a service that has a purpose and on top of it you're having this nice storytelling of being sustainably uh, you know source materials and have sustainable development embedded into your DNA and and that becomes more and more efficient uh, in in getting private investors interested into your product but essentially sustainable development is clearly the way forward and it's something that should not scare anyone because if you want to raise money you'll have to have that component into your business strategy definitely definitely and tell me alexi how do you think uh south africa compares on a global scale when it comes to environmental awareness uh and some of our efforts towards uh, sustainability <laughs> okay it's a tricky question i'm in south africa right now so uh but uh <laughs> The, it's sort of our perspective, right? Which includes a bit, you know, the notions of priorities and education, which uh, you know are um, are important factors here. Um, but a lot of people, uh, and even more, uh, you know, these days, are worrying uh, more about how to put food on the table uh, tomorrow, you know, the and not the next year. Uh, and that's worrying in a sense, but it's understandable. It's worrying because. By doing so, you can trap yourself into a vicious circle where you keep on having to adjust uh, and thereby worry about the tomorrow again and again um, and never really see much further ahead. Uh, but it's understandable, obviously, because uh, no one can can be passive or passively bear the thought of not having, uh, you know, not knowing what you would put on your table the day after tomorrow. And, and, and it's even worse when you have a family to feed. Uh, but uh, in Europe, most households have the basic uh, needs covered and they can worry about um, other stuff uh, such as sustainable development and the way they behave and whatnot however there are basic things that one can do that have nothing to do with you know that, that doesn't cost anything like throwing not throwing your trash on the street it has nothing to do with the fact that you don't have anything to eat at the end of the day or not these are basic stuff so the, they there are a few things uh a lot of things are different between Europe and, and South Africa, but South Africa is doing, I believe, great. It needs a little more push in helping people prioritize and educate, but you see there's a lot of outreach programs, uh, and such as the Two Oceans Aquarium Foundations, that are helping a lot in educating further um, you know, people in South Africa, and particularly the underserved communities that need to understand if you've never been told that throwing your trash um, on the street will end up in the ocean, and then if your father is a fisherman, then you won't have food on your table at the end of the day. You can't, you can't think of it. You can't imagine this. So, not much, not that many difference because we're all humans. It just need a little more education, some, in some places. But um, wherever there's a crisis, there's an opportunity, and I believe there's mm. a lot to be done, and it's a good thing. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank, thank you, Alexi. Um, which, which brings me back to my next point around uh, content generation, 
expanding on this narrative and really creating awareness uh, within our industries around these points. Um, and Jasper, I'm going to go back to you because in building a successful black sure. brand like Sealand here, um, you know, there's there's obviously certain things to look out for when when it comes to communication. Um, so do you want to mm. shed some light on on that? Yeah, I think um, it's great that we we refer to Sealand as a as a brand and it's 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 gaining its momentum and success. Um, you know, we've recently I look back on the, uh, mine and Mike's original blueprint of the business and that we did five years ago and where we find ourselves today is literally 99% spot on to what we created in the beginning and I think our timing to market was great around the sustainable story as Alexis mentioned right now it's not really a competitive edge anymore it's basically just an operating standard which if you're not doing you're falling short but when we launched Sealand, it was certainly was a competitive edge. We were sort of first, not first to market, but we were one of the first to market in the South African context. Um, and staying true to our original strategy, staying auth and, and auth authentic and true and honest to what we believed in as a brand. And because myself and Mike as the founders of the brand really built the, the brand image around the lifestyles which we lived and aspired to, which are outdoor, uh, which are honest, which are environmentally responsible ones, it wasn't difficult mm. for us to communicate that as a brand. As we've grown now, it's just been very important for us to not lose sight of who we are uh, and really to to look at how we can communicate the brand in, in a great way possible. Um, and also understanding that, you know, South Africa, our market in South Africa is, is a, it's a niche market. It's a small market. And from the beginning, we've always set ourselves this goal that Sealand is a brand with its roots in Cape Town. And it's inspired by what happens and what we do in Cape Town. However, we want to build a global brand. And uh, it's amazing to see how it's going and how we, we're making tracks and we, we featured and represented in, in global retail outlets like Selfridges and Mr. Porter and Liberty and the likes. And last year we had the, the beauty of opening up our own flagship experience store, which is part of the waterfront precinct in a, in a brand or relatively new area called Dock Road Junction, which connects the city to the VNA waterfront. And all of those elements were outlined in our original blueprint, but uh, it's just been awesome to track and watch the business taking these steps one step at a time and gaining the momentum and working with brilliant people and working with brilliant brand partners and a combination of our original story, our brand partners, amazing people. It's, it's building the brand in the way which we, we really are proud to see it growing in. Um, so building a brand is not an easy thing. It's, you know, being an entrepreneurial, building a brand like a roller coaster. You have major ups and you also have major downs. And, you know, the, 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 the environment we're navigating through right now with COVID, as with generally all businesses, it's an incredibly challenging time. Um, but again, as Alexa says, where there's a crisis or where there's, where there's a challenge, there's an opportunity. And I think that's a very important thing to embrace. And I'm an optimistic 100%. person by nature, so I always want to look at it half full, look at the opportunities in, 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 in the challenging environments, and I think that will see one succeed and build the, the, the empire that we're looking, or the, the global brand which we're trying to do. Exactly, exactly. And what I love about what you've mentioned is this, uh, you know, uh, trial and error, building yourself up. Um, and Davis, I want to expand on, on your story a little, because, you know, I think going back to Alexi's point around having the resources and having accessibility to a network is one thing. But what I love about your story is, you know, you've uh, you've launched this amazing brand, these amazing products. You went on to actually educate yourself in the territory of media, marketing, communication, uh, so much so that uh, you gave a tour of your studio to Miley Cyrus, uh, which made headlines and social media. Um, and that didn't take, you know, uh, an executive MBA or, you know, you've had you've had your barriers to the industry. So I'd like to unpack, you know, some of the things that 
that always stayed at, at the top of your mind when building this brand? And, you know, just from a mentorship perspective, what advice can you offer to our young designers out there? Thank you. I think I think to me the only thing I can tell I can tell them is that to to follow their creative guts and to try to align their creativity uh, with the market in mind uh, rather than uh, creating stuff to create uh, to create the business and uh, and because I believe even though the new brand will have uh, to contend with a changed consumer behavior and consumer base that is considerably. Um, with much less purchasing power. Um, I, I believe the pandemic has, has and will continue uh, to create opportunities for sustainable conscious bread. And um, if they can do that, I think, uh, because I, I think with this pandemic, uh, people will, will try, will be, uh, even if though they, they have limited, uh, limited um, purchasing power, they will try to, to shop in the places where it's more ethically um, um, things are ethically made, and uh, I think also so the other thing is in um, um, in hard, I think every business is, is suffering, but uh, I think in hard made world um, we have an advantage that we are more flexible, we can we are easy to adapt, and uh, I think that, which I think is very crucial uh, at this time, and. Um, yeah, that's all what I can tell them. I can tell them that's uh, that, that's to me that is uh, very 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 important. Beautiful, beautiful, such powerful words and uh, and really, I think uh, as you said, the the pandemic has definitely created a shift to do things better. Um, and that brings us to to the wrap of our session. Uh, we do we did have a competition component, but stay tuned to our social media and one lucky winner walks away with a gorgeous Sealand bag. Um, and we do encourage you to check out the rest of the 100 Beautiful Things project. Um, go on to 100beautifulthings.co.za. Uh, and if you have any other stories or makers to nominate, uh, that's where you can submit. So thank you very much for joining us on the somewhat warm Thursday afternoon. Uh, keep well and stay safe. And thank you to our speakers. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers, Will there guys. be any questions? Bye -bye. Bye -bye.